welcome to everyone. Uh, we, we, we are uh, pleased to come together on this subject, uh, on this webinar that has come really out of the need and part of our ongoing. Um, sorry, my video is off. Sorry, sorry. Let me put that on. Very sorry. Okay. So yeah, we are we are um, on an ongoing drive to continue capacity building and also responding to the needs that come from our partners and some of the um, uh, collaborations that we have, uh, whether it is with academic institutions, whether it is with um, service providers of palliative care, or whether it is with um, like-minded people like ourselves who are working in uh, capacity building and palliative care development. So you are most welcome to today's uh, seminar. We shall use the Q&A mostly as our default channel of communication. We shall use the Q&A section. Please, if you can submit your, um, your, your questions as Prof. Musisi will be presenting. Um, Prof. Segan Musisi is not a visitor uh, on APCA uh, events and APCA webinars. Uh, we have seen him even through the COVID times. He also was with us, uh, but he's a professor of psychiatry and is the former chair of the Department of Psychiatry at Makerere University College of Health Sciences. And he's a senior consultant psychiatrist at Mulago National Referral and Teaching Hospital and the Uganda Ministry of Health. Uh, I could go on and on if I wanted to read his full profile, but we want to get to the business that we are here for. Uh, our apologies if uh, someone was trying to connect a little bit earlier, but uh, we did manage just on the top of the hour. So you are most welcome. Please insert your comments and your uh, contributions while he's presenting. Uh, you can present, you can com uh, communicate through the Q&A. If people need to say something, I think you have the option to raise your hand, then we can give you the option to speak. Thank you so much. Our IT is going to join us a little bit later, but I think we can manage. Um, we have also with us the ED for, uh, for APCA. I think you can see Dr. Emmanuel is here with us. We have the French channel for interpretation for our colleagues who are following the session in French. And we have Eugene Rusanganwa, who is one of our colleagues, is a program officer at APCA, and he's doing the interpretation for us in French. So uh, welcome to also our colleagues who are speaking, who need, uh, who are speaking French. Please just go to the interpretation um, at the bottom of the log. You will see the sign of the globe, and you will pick the French channel there. Let me hand over time to Prof. Musisi. Uh, so that we can get down to the business of the day. Thank you. So, so uh, the topic that he's presenting on, of course, is what you have signed on the effects of grief and bereavement on brain health uh, and well-being, uh, and scoping of common symptoms and triggers for referral. Thank you, Prof. Thank you. Uh, let me share my screen. Uh, here we go. Is it there? Okay. Okay, so that is our topic for today. And uh, I'm going to be speaking mainly uh, for about maybe uh, 40 minutes or so, and then uh, after that, we can have some questions and answers. Uh, the topic was very long, so I decided to uh, summarize it as bereavement. And uh, bereavement, grieving, and mourning are terms that are often used interchangeably for the psychological reactions of those who survive a significant loss. And the key word there is loss. But these terms are different, uh, but they're closely related. Grief is a subjective feeling precipitated by the death of a loved one. So if you will say parent, a child, a friend, that immediate psychological feeling you get is grief. But mourning is the process by which this grief is going to be relieved or resolved. And bereavement is the state of being deprived of somebody by death. So as you see, 
that process of bereavement could go on for a long time. So uh, we, we thought uh, after those definitions is that we'll talk about grief, the experience of distress in the face of bereavement or loss. That's what is meant by grief. It's a combination really of two processes that happen simultaneously. One, there is the separation distress. You've lost somebody, they are gone. You yearn, you cry, you search, you feel lonely. Then there's the emotional distress, a disbelief that indeed that someone is gone, the anger you feel, the emptiness, the sadness. So what we mean by grief is a complex confluence of many things, of individual, social, national, political, cultural, relational, historical factors and experiences. Grieving usually is individual, say for the death of a loved one, but can also be communal, involving the whole community or even the nation or the world. For example, following a disaster or following a pandemic, the whole world was grieving. Or you can lose somebody very important to the whole world, like for example, Nelson Mandela, the whole world grieved, you know. Uh, but grief can also be operationalized as a loss or absence of one's identity or familiar surroundings. For example, if you're going to exile, you can grieve of having lost whatever was familiar to you. We have to distinguish grief from the effects of a trauma or injury. For example, pain. That's different. The grieving period is usually about three months, but may last up to six or 12 months before it resolves. Sometimes may even start before the loss, anticipatory grief in advance of an unexpected loss. Uh, and when that loss happens, this anticipatory grief ends, but the other grief may continue. But you can also have grief adversary reactions. For example, with the triggers of the lost one or reminders of that person you lost or the anniversary date of the loss. So classically, grief was this defined by Elizabeth Kubler-Ross as five stages of grief, of having lost someone, or really of the anticipation of you dying. Now, other people have defined other stages you know, of bereavement or grief, uh, but today we want to all lump them into these five stages. The first one is the denial, the shock that you've lost somebody. You feel dazed, you refuse to believe it's really true. You feel bewildered, numb, you protest. Then the second stage comes. You feel angry, frustrated, irritable, you despair, you blame, you fear, you worry. Then the third stage comes, called bargaining. You beg, for example, if you have a terminal illness, can I live a little bit longer? You may go to prayers, maybe expecting a magical solution, wanting to negotiate. But then the inevitable is there. So you may go into a depression. You withdraw, you isolate, you may lose sleep, you may lose appetite, you may feel hopeless, helpless, you lose energy, you may even have suicidal ideation. All these happen. And then finally is acceptance that the inevitable has happened. Uh, and then you begin to kind of rationalize about it. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, uh, you may say it is universal, or you may say, well, you can't fear death. You know, you remember those who died before you, or those who, who went before you, those who are going to, and are going to die now, and those who will come after you. But you realize that death is irreversible, immutable, it's final. And usually for people with this impending expression of one's demise, you sort of kind of, once you accept, you reach some kind of satisfaction with your resolution uh, of that. But the grieving distress itself is driven by loss. That's the important thing to always remember. And uh, these losses could be social, cultural, psychological, or body parts, anatomical, or material, or ecological. So we can talk about types of loss. 
For example, human loss, you lose a loved one, a family member, a friend, a colleague, neighbors, comrades. Then there's status loss. For example, you can have a marital breakup. You've lost your marriage. Or you could drop in social class. You may lose a lot of money, go into poverty, bankruptcy. You may lose your job. You could grieve about it. Political losses, election losses. You could be demoted at a job. All those are losses. Then there are material losses, losing property, may have, may, maybe to stolen, losing your money, uh, your stocks, your possessions, your pets, your home, your land, your country. Then there's situational loss. For example, you may lose your identity, you may lose your culture, you may lose your country. You may be taken over by another one. Wars are fought over that. You may lose your familiar surroundings. Like for example, when you migrate or you go into exile. Or you could lose your health. You could have a severe terminal illness or a maiming illness. You could lose part of your body like an amputation or mastectomy. Or you could have a traumatic loss, which can be a loss-related trauma or a nonetheless-related trauma. And then there are ambiguous losses, like environmental losses. When you have a cascade of losses or loss spirals, which are non personal, but are, are large and mass losses and impact you. For example, wars, environments, environmental disasters, pandemics, economic downturns, like the Great Depression. This usually often results in fewer remaining resources to protect one against further loss. All of these are accompanied by grieving. So what are the symptoms of grieving or grief? One are these high express, expressed emotions of anger, crying, yearning, worry, sadness, the feeling of bitterness. You may have sleep difficulties, you can't sleep well, nightmares, startling out of sleep. Then you may have cognitive difficulties, poor concentration, poor memory. You may have preoccupation with the dead, even sometimes, even preparing meals for them or preparing clothes or taking care of their belongings. You may have anxiety symptoms, panic like symptoms, flashbacks, start of fear. Someone has gone, am I next? Then you can have emotion based symptoms, survivor guilt. You may begin to have self reproach did I miss something? Was it my fault? You may have feelings of hopelessness or an hedonia, feeling that you can never be happy again. And then you go into that depression, feeling withdrawn, low, dejected, depressed. You may even have death wishes. Sometimes you grief, we grieve with physical symptoms, nausea, muscle tension, body aches and pains, feeling numb, lacking appetite, headaches, no energy. But what are the types of uh, ways of how we can cope with grief. First, we have to understand that many factors impact on grief, but grief can be unresolved. For example, when you lose several loved ones quickly, not knowing or not knowing their whereabouts, or not being able to engage in end of life rituals, for example, funerals, vigils, burials, mm -hmm. chronic systemic stressors, uh, when you have no supports, these tend to kind of create a problem whereby your grief may not be resolved. You may experience multiple stressors, and this negatively impact on your, in a, on your ability to cope with the grieving process. Mm -hmm. It may impair your psychological well being due to this enduring uh, repeated adversity. Uh, and then coping responses are variable themselves and complex, and they're shaped by individual specific factors to you. And we shall talk more about those and what resources you have at hand. Mm -hmm. And you'll find that people have different uh, ways to respond to life stressors uh, in multidimensional ways, uh, which may serve different functions and purposes. And again, we shall see some of those. But whatever the disadvantages that one may have, we have to remember that people are not born inherently weak. People are born with the strength to 
resolve and go on. Mm -hmm. uh, but environments in which we are impact or buffer our stress responses or accentuate our risk factors uh, and may cause us to, to develop disorders through, uh, as we grieve. But culture, traditions, beliefs, social supports, religious or customary rituals are all integral to the healing process in grief and how we are going to be able to cope. For example, the funerals we hold, the vigils, the barriers, the prayers. But this may sometimes be inhibited or limited. For example, in wars, how or when we have infectious epidemics like COVID-19, we're not allowed to go and bury because we thought we do not want to spread infection. And this impaired grieving and caused problems later. The grieving process is influenced by gender, age, education, social class, past experiences of our diversity. Uh, and this impact on how we are going to grieve. Uh, so support seeking is very important. And where, that's where we go first from loved ones, family or friends, neighbors, through religion. Mental health services come in later, but future oriented thinking usually tends to really. But some people engage in negative coping mechanisms. For example, substance abuse, violence, overwork, promiscuous sex, fleeing or escaping through denial or avoiding or physically leaving the place itself. Some people feel helpless and resign, a sense of overwhelm and helplessness. What can we do when the God help, can help us? These people usually wait, sometimes they dare. These are negative. What about pathological bereavement? What do we mean by pathological bereavement? This is a complicated bereavement, it's abnormal. It often occurs in those who suffer sudden unexpected losses. For example, through circumstances that are horrific, like trauma or torture. When your loved ones die through trauma or torture, it's painful. Or when you are socially isolated. Or when you believe somehow, whether real or not real, that somehow you are responsible for the death of the loved one. Or when you are ambivalent or in very dependent relationships with them, they tend to cause abnormality in grief. So, what are the types of these pathological griefs or bereavements? One, grieving may be delayed or even absent. When it's delayed, the symptoms come later. Or it may be prolonged or excessively intense beyond the norm. And we shall talk about that. Uh, sometimes people develop overt depression, consequent bereavement. They get negative feelings of shame, guilt, self-esteem, or worthlessness. These are rare in grief, but when they happen, then you know that maybe one is developed depression from the grief. Grieving itself fluctuates, but even as we are grieving, we may laugh. For example, people laugh at funerals. Mm -hmm. They even take selfies. You remember some of those famous ones, like Obama took when they were, were grieving from Nelson Mandela. Mm -hmm. uh, so grieving fluctuates and responds to support and empathy and passage of time. Depression may not do that by itself, it needs an intervention. There may be suicidal ideation in grief or development of psychotic symptoms or it's substance abuse. All of these point to pathological bereavement, not normal bereavement, and they will need intervention. So how do we manage grief? First, we have to remember that uncomplicated grieving is normal. It's expected, it is civilized, it's cultural, it is healthy, it's cathartic, and it's self-limiting. When you are not allowed to grieve, you may not have that cathartic feeling about grief. Some cultures encourage wailing or loud crying to express the grief reaction. 
Uh, so people must be allowed to grieve in accordance to their cultural expectations. Uh, unless if circumstances prohibit grieving, for example, in an active war situation, you may not be able to grieve. Or we saw with the infectious, infectious epidemics, you may not be able to grieve the way you would not, not culturally grieve. Normally, grieving persons really rarely seek psychiatric help because it is expected that grieving is normal and we know it will end, it will heal. So we as practitioners should not routinely refer patients who are grieving for counselors or psychiatrists. There's nothing abnormal in grieving until you see something very divergent. For example, very severe sleep disruption or developing vegetative symptoms of depression or developing psychotic symptoms or suicidal ideations. Then you may refer somebody to a professional. Otherwise, the grieving process is normal. So the first mode of intervention when you see something adverse or in grieving is to give emotional support from family, from friends, from community or clergy. So you find that those who are isolated, that uh, intervention is interfered with and may cause abnormal grief. The grieving person should be encouraged to go through the mourning process, including being given time to take off time from work so that we can engage in what is expected of them culturally, traditionally, socially, religiously, or customarily. Medicating grieving persons interferes with the normal process of grieving or mourning, however painful it may seem to be. So it's not good to just medicate them and numb their feelings. It is important to let them grieve so that grief can resolve naturally. But if we have to intervene professionally, what do we do? So we call that grief therapy or counseling and can be done individually or in a group. Usually group therapy involves regularly scheduled supportive sessions, allowing the, indiv the grieved individual to talk about their loss, to talk about their lost ones and what this loss means to them. To express their feelings, maybe of anger, or frustration, or survivor guilt, tearfulness, to cry, self-reproach. And you tell them that these are normal reactions in the grieving period. They should not blame themselves. They should not feel bad. You encourage the grieved or the grieving person to reach out, to socialize in their, with their family, with their community, and not to isolate themselves. They may attend self-help groups in cultural centers or places of worship, seeking emotional support and companionship. Medications are the last resort, and they should only be used when we are treating disorders in grieving. For example, sleep problems that are disrupting one's life, significant depression when you have to give out psychotics development of psychotic symptoms, and you have to give uh, antipsychotics. This should be left to professionals. And only when uh, the grieving person has been referred to them. Professional intervention may include hospitalization and psychiatric treatment for these pathological bereavements. And the indications usually are severe depression, which is beyond the norm suicidal ideation or attempt, development of psychotic symptoms, or excessive substance abuse. So in other words, we should look at grieving as a normal process, unless if, if one develops uh, those symptoms of pathological bereavement. Uh, it is normal to grieve. All we need is support and companionship so that we go through the process. Thank you. That's the end of my presentation. And we can now opt out of sharing slices, slides, and 
I'll be able to respond to any questions or comments. Back to the moderator. Thank you very much, Prof. Thank you for that enlightening presentation. Um, I would like maybe to just give a bit of time to the Q&A if there are any questions there that need you to address. Otherwise, uh, yeah, if we can just check what's in the Q&A so that you can address. Uh, Dr. Emmanuel, you can help us if there are any issues that have been raised there. Uh, to the participants, if you would like to say something, just put your hand up and you will be enabled to speak. Otherwise, you can give your contribution through the chat or through the Q&A section. Dr. Emmanuel. Thank you very much, Wes Right. Thank you very much, Prof, for that um, very rich presentation and a very timely one at that. Uh, in terms of the Q&A, we had one question in the chat from Madam Rosemary Chuanuka, and I'll, I'll read it for you, Prof. Uh, yes. It's about um, a gentleman who lost um, his wife and is still uh, moving around with a picture of the wife and does not allow anybody to sit in her position in the car, in her seat. Um, I hope Rosa picked that uh, properly from, from, from the chat. So Prof, I think I'll let you talk about that as yes. we wait for the questions yes. to come. Yeah, we, we talked about self-report. Some, sometimes what people do and being preoccupied with the dead is normal. Uh, but it becomes pathological when it begins to interfere with function and with your inability to move forward, that future thinking. If this gentleman is just carrying his picture, the picture of his wife, that's okay. But not allowing somebody to sit uh, in the co driver's seat is going a little bit beyond. And you begin to wonder whether that bereavement is going to is going to interfere with him, with his function. That becomes pathological. Uh, so uh, this has gone on for a year. And we say that sometimes breathing can go on up to a year. So I think uh, this individual should be helped to overcome that. And uh, an anniversary at that time uh, may be important for him. And you say a year has gone by, you go through the anniversary of your wife's death, you say whatever you may have some kind of function and then close that chapter. But to carry memoirs of the, of the, of the deceased is very common. We have pictures of parents, grandparents in houses, uh, yes. Uh, in the literature, there have been all kinds of uh, stories. Uh, there is a guy who uh, exhumed, uh, I think his wife's body and mummified it and kept it in the house. Uh, these are known. Eventually, the police had to be involved with that gentleman. So these are pathological. So you go to what the culture says and uh, what society expects to be part of normal grieving for that culture. So this is a little bit beyond, but kind of picture is culturally accepted in most cultures. Yes. Um, Thank you very much, Prof. There's another question from Afolabi. Uh, have you managed the case of, of pathological grief before? If yes, can you please outline how you manage such? Thank you. Uh, yes, <laughs> I have been in practice for a long time. I have managed both normal and abnormal grief. Uh, usually parents, and we do not talk about this, may bring their children after they have lost, say one parent has died, and then they say the children are not, and may have a problem. Uh, and usually it depends on their, their ages and their experiences and how the death happened. Uh, but usually the abnormal grief that I've dealt with happens when there have been sudden unexpected deaths. For example, we saw many deaths in the pandemic. We saw, we have seen deaths in war 
I've seen murders, I've seen accidents. Uh, people with such abnormal deaths usually will come for some kind of uh, psychiatric help. Uh, and usually it is, it, like we said before, it's a question of giving them support, of uh, encouraging them to, uh, to use the community and what is out there, not to isolate themselves, and to be future thinking and going with their life. When it becomes pathological, say with depression, symptoms, then you may give an antidepressant. Or with psychotic symptoms, then you may give an antipsychotic. I've seen one uh, individual I remember very long ago, I will never forget this. Uh, it was a gentleman who had lost a daughter and he had literally uh, wasted away although he was saying that he was okay. Uh, and he was being given therapy, psychotherapy alone. Uh, not to beat this down, but by a psychoanalyst. Uh, and he was not improving. And there was a, a young resident at that time, postgraduate, and I put him on a mitutin, and he got out of that depression. And he began eating, and he began sleeping well, and he resolved his grief and went on with his life. Uh, and since then, I have learned that, yes, uh, pathological bereavement is there and it needs professional uh, interference. Some people even advocate that it can reach the point of giving uh, ECT, electroconvulsive therapy, and somebody who is not improving. Uh, I've seen some of those, yes. So yes, I have treated pathological bereavement many times. But for usual grieving, support, encouragement to move on is what we usually do best individually or in groups. Thank you, Prof. Uh, there's a question from Eddie. Uh, thank you, Prof. Musi, for this wonderful presentation. My question is in palliative care, most of our patients reach end of life and the serial losses can indeed affect professional caregivers like nurses. What's the best approach to supporting palliative care nurses and doctors for the serial losses they are suffering and will mm -hmm. continue to suffer? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, I kind of steered away from that, but now that the question has arisen, we can talk about it. That is not actual grieving. That is post-traumatic stress, or sometimes we call callous traumatization. For example, we saw it a lot in the pandemic. We see it a lot in cancer wards, or usually in children's wards with multiple deaths uh, of cancer children, especially, um, whereby the therapist, the clinician, the doctor, the nurse uh, uh, becomes traumatized and they can't cope. Um, and then we have to give them support and counseling. Um, usually we say that people who work in such units uh, should always be given time off work and they should be able to transfer and go to other worlds to kind of relieve that continuous traumatization all the time. Uh, in other words, if you work in the intensive care unit or in the cancer ward or in a COVID ward, uh, don't stay there for too long a time. Work two weeks and then have some, another or in months and then transfer to another ward, you know, uh, with a different type of service. Uh, for example, general medicine uh, or our patients, uh, so that you can go through this trauma uh, and then you can go back to that. So yes, that we see and we have to help colleagues who are, who are in these kinds of situations. We saw it a lot uh, in the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, people who worked in those uh, isolation units, yes. I see RD here um, in the chat group. Randy Diamond said in the US, our palliative care social workers often bereavement support groups for families or patients who have died, yeah? or patients who have died. Yes, yes, we said that yes, we can be individual or group. Do we have that in Uganda? I really have not seen that yet, uh, but there's certainly a hospital of that which we can talk about, especially for people who are giving palliative care. Uh, yes, 
I think it's a very viable option. But we'll have to remember that in Uganda, breathing is very cultural. There are cultural prescribed grieving uh, or bereavement things that people do. For example, there are vigils. Uh, I do not want, we have, we're talking with a much an international audience. Uh, so I didn't want to use some of these words, which may be very local. Uh, but culturally, people gather when somebody has died, uh, they may say prayers, uh, then they attend the funeral, and they again come back to see that the individual has lost somebody. And that coming back can go on uh, for a long time. They could even come six months later for somebody just to pay their respects to you, as if they did, but they're really giving that respect to you. And then their last funeral rites, whereby, quote, after that, culturally, the grieving process should stop and they put on air and it should go on. These are specific cultural things and uh, wakes. Uh, for example, uh, um, Judaism you know, and things like that, uh, which are prescribed. So these are different things right? and different, uh, or in Islam, for I think 40 days, you know, and things like that. So these are different things that different groups do according to their cultures, their religious beliefs, uh, or their societies. Uh, but um, I did not want to go into the, the specifics. That's to say that traditional, cultural, customary, religious uh, grieving should be allowed uh, according to the individual who is grieving. Thank you very much, Prof. There is a, there are two questions. One is from a DRC, but let me start with the longer one. Uh, I lost family members, um, uh, most, mostly my mom and sister in one year, and then my two brothers, one month at a difference of five days apart. I feel confused to date. What is your advice, uh, Prof? Thank you. Thank you. That's a very good question. We said repeated deaths or losses cause pathological grieving. You don't allow time for the first grieving to resolve and another one happens. That person should see a professional. Uh, they will need some professional help because those are too frequent or frequent members, and that's become, that becomes pathological bereavement, which can go into uh, a depression. Yes. So that one should see, certainly see somebody for professional help, for grief therapy. For grief therapy. You. And then from our colleagues in Aru, in DRC, what is your advice for the culture that obliges people to bury someone with all his goods or belongings? For a cult that encourages somebody. Culture or cult? Culture. Culture. Okay, different cultures have different ways of grieving. You know, there's a culture somewhere I think in the Indian Ocean, uh, you probably have heard of it, where people even go and exhume that body and walk around with it for some time. It is accepted in that culture. It may be very abnormal in other cultures. So different cultures have different ways of doing these things. Uh, there are cultures which say, hey, we don't, more, we celebrate the life of the individual. It may become meaningless for some people. Right? So we have to go to the specific culture and see the meaning of that in that culture. There are no cultures that are right. There are no cultures that are wrong. Cultures are cultures. So you have to go to that specific culture to see the meaning of that in that culture. Uh, but people should be allowed to grieve in accordance to their cultural persuasion. And there's no culture which should impose its ways of mourning onto the others. I remember a comment from South Africa, uh, whereby there was a lot of video and dancing and music and stuff like that. And somebody said, are these Africans celebrating or are they mourning? And I think it was Julius Mulema who said, no one should tell us how to mourn. Different cultures 
have different ways of mourning. And you don't impose one sculpture to another one because the different ways of mourning. What we should see is what is culturally acceptable in that culture, and we follow that. Wailing, for example, crying out loud is very much acceptable as a type of a grieving process in Uganda here. I don't think you do that in Sweden or in England, different cultures. But if you tell our people here that, hey, you can't wait, you can't mourn, you can't do that, they'll say you're very unkind, you're not allowing us to cry. You're not allowing us to mourn our death. So different cultures, different ways of doing things. Like I say, there's no right culture, there's no wrong culture. So there's no right cultural mourning as opposed to another culture's mourning as being the right one. No. Just understand what is specific to that culture and do that, or religion and do that. Um, thank you, Prof. There's another question. Can a person's prior mental health influence development of complicated grief following loss of a loved one? Yes, again, uh, I pointed it out, but uh, that one's past experience impacts on where you are going to mourn. Uh, that experience may be disease, uh, it may be a trauma, uh, it may be a, a losses that they have gone through. Yes, they impact on the way one is going to mourn and on how you're going to support that somebody as they go through the grieving process. I see EB here, Edward Bulolo, Bosa. Bulolo, I see. Mm -hmm. With reference, my submission is a person who does not even want to eat. Bringing tones. Why me? Or yes. In the initial stages, those are normal reactions. If they persist for a long time, that one loses appetite and loss and losing weight, it becomes pathological grief. It has gone into depression. That's when you refer that somebody for proper psychiatric assessment and intervention. Um, thank you, Prof. There has been a hand up of Joven Jibio on Ongole. Yes. Your hand has been up and you can now raise your question. Joven, you can unmute and Pose your question. Is Joven, has, has Joven heard? Uh, I'm trying to unmute, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Yes, Joven, how are you? I'm fine, Emmanuel, nice to see you again from medical Thank school you. the last time I saw you. <laughs> <laughs> I still remember. <laughs> Go on. Yes. Okay. Uh, it, is, it is about the, the, the live experience. Um, uh, I, I, I practice in different settings, and some of them are culturally, they, what they practice is also so different. So it becomes sometimes almost impossible to provide palliative care because. We go with the, the formal tradition, formal way of supporting the family, but also they have their very unique way of applying, of, of, of allowing the people from outside into their space. And it becomes so extremely difficult. Uh, so one of the thing is before you can even see the patient, they want to perform rituals before you assess the patient. Uh, and it becomes also, you have also your own beliefs, which becomes very difficult in the way they're conducting their traditional ways. So in, in, in the old hand, how do you balance uh, your approach to formal traditional, formal, formal palliative care approach? and then to the way they practice their own cultural belief and practices. And they want to impose it on you as well before you assess the patient. Ah, 
Mm -hmm. I have seen that commonly, especially in this country. Uh, one is that we have to know that there's a space for expressions, uh, which may be cultural or religious, and there's a space for medical intervention. Uh, it is important that you differentiate the two for the relatives uh, or friends. And it's also important, in a, for example, in the hospital setting, that whatever they're doing does not interfere with the other one. I'll give you an example before I direct answer your question. I had a patient who wanted to play loud prayer music for the whole world because they thought that, well, it cannot be wrong to pray for people to get better and uh, looking for blessings from God. So they're going to keep loud music for everybody on the whole world, literally keeping them awake. And of course, it was causing great stress to the other patients and caretakers. So we have to tell the individual that no, it's okay to pray and God is everywhere. You can say these loud prayers in your home surroundings, but leave this environment for therapeutic intervention by the clinicians. So you may have to tell those relatives exactly that, that it's okay, God will hear them, wherever they are, but at this moment in time, you have to offer a specific service to that. Now, when it comes to you, the, the therapist or the clinician, you always have to be objective and you try not to impose your views on your religious views and beliefs on patients or, or their relatives, but they should also not uh, put their views and beliefs onto you. Each one should keep their own, as it said, their side of the nose or their nostril. In other words, uh, they should not interfere with your work, you also don't interfere with them. But uh, rituals done on patients uh, that you're looking after, which interfere with what you're doing, should not be encouraged in hospital settings or in care settings. Uh, and they can usually be quite problematic. Um, I remember treating patients uh, and they were also giving their own herbal medications at the same time. And you can imagine the kind of drug-drug interactions that can happen with the drugs you don't know. Mm -hmm. So they can be problematic. And you use a diplomatic way of telling them uh, not to interfere with what you're doing, but that you give them space to do what they want to do. But not yet, but not interfering again with uh, what you're doing. Sometimes uh, people who want to impose their views may actually be negative to your patient. For example, uh, I remember one patient who was being told that they may go to hell, you know, unless if they did this because they were about to die. And the patient began to worry too much. Mm -hmm. And you see that this is beginning to interfere with the patient's welfare. Mm -hmm. So, uh, German, you, you have to use your clinical judgment about that, but it should not be interfere with what you're doing and should not interfere, interfere with the patient's welfare. I think I saw another question here about uh, Ellen Kajura, who was saying, how do you help a nine-year-old child who had lost a parent so, uh, in a tragic accident, how do you help them grieve? Yes, uh, grieving for children changes with their understanding of death. Before age seven or five, uh, children are not very much aware of the finality of death. And they're not aware whether inanimate and living things, uh, uh, the difference between them. But as they go beyond that, they begin to realize, especially between age you know, seven to 10, that yes, death happens, death can happen to them, death can happen to parents, uh, and you tend to support them according to what they already know, what they've been exposed to, culturally or religiously uh, or in the community. Uh, but sometimes it's quite difficult, but putting, a familiar other parent or relative or caretaker in 
together with that child always helps them cope better. For example, the father here had died. If the mother is alive and they're still together, or whoever care, other caretaker must be in close proximity with the nine-year-old to give them the support and the encouragement to go on and to tell them that things will be all right uh, in life. Uh, but it was sad that father is no longer there. Uh, what you do not do is tell them lies uh, that you know, father is coming back or that we are going to meet them soon. Uh, you may tell them about the afterlife, depending on your belief systems, uh, but you don't tell them lies that tomorrow we are going to be with them or something like that, uh, because that may be problematic uh, to them. Um, culturally, children should be allowed to attend funerals of their beloved ones to know the finality of what has happened and to accept it and then to go on with life. It's not a good idea to hide them uh, or never to tell them the information. Um, um, yes. Thank you. There, there is also, sometimes there's also another problem whereby certain relatives may not want you to participate in two uh, or families uh, in, to participate in two grieving processes. Those usually cause pathological grief. Uh, sometimes there may be ways to address that, either culturally or legally. Yes, go ahead. Thank you, Prof. There is another question. It's quite a private question, but it has come through. I lost my wife in 2005. I have since moved on and started another family in 2014. However, there are moments that I feel strongly about her loss and seem not able to go over this. Could this be a sign that I have to go for bereavement counseling? Uh, it is very important. That's a very good question. Many people go through that. Uh, it is part of those feelings that you get. Uh, it is very much important to involve the current wife, the current spouse into that because they may react to you not having let go of the past. So it is important that both, both of them go for counsel together to a professional to see how to sell through that. It also involves children to accept the new spouse, which may be difficult for them, and how they are going to call them. Different cultures impose different ways of how you're going to relate to them. Uh, again, uh, we have to go back to our cultural traditions to see how to deal with that. It's not a good idea to force. Again, professional help should be sought. These are all pathological or abnormal grief or bereavements. Yes, please. I don't know that that's good enough. Thank you very much, Prof. Um, do we have any other questions or any hands up? Was Rai, can you see any hands up? Um, it's actually not a question, but just a couple of comments that have been put by Prof. Wilson Akuda. Just, uh, I think it's almost like a notification. Training in bereavement management is offered at palliative case, uh, to palliative care students at the Institute of Hospice and Palliative Care module called Death and Bereavement. I think it's just so that people can be aware of um, that course in the event that people need that. I also mentioned that um, uh, at Hospice Africa Uganda, bereavement counseling is offered to bereaved families during Memorial Days, which are held annually in November. So thanks, Prof. Akuda. It's good to have you here. Yeah. And I see Prof's hand is still up, so let me allow him to talk. Prof Akuda, let me open so that you can unmute and uh, uh, make your contribution. Prof Wilson, you are now open to speak. Professor Akuda, I'm waiting for you.
I think he's muted. Send him a message on chat. Okay, as, as we wait, um, we wait for that. We have um, a, a, a comment from a quest, a comment from Dorothy. I lost a sister in labor in 2004 and her child survived. I failed to fully embrace this child. I still hold her as a cause for this death, even when I know this is wrong. How do I move past this? Uh -huh. Well, strictly speaking, Dorothy, that's pathological bereavement. Uh, a, you haven't let go of the sister. You have not accepted the finality of death of that sister to move on. Uh, so I think uh, Dorothy needs to see a therapist uh, to be helped through this. Uh, and not to hold the innocent child responsible for a disease that happened and killed the mother. Uh, that child has a life in the future and an innocence that they came into the world with. So I think uh, Dorothy Nakazi should seek professional help um, to be able to sail through that. Especially before the child becomes bigger because they'll sense that. Thank you, Prof. Let's go back to Professor Wilson and see if he can um, unmute himself and talk. Prof, maybe it's your microphone. We can't hear a thing. I see you are unmuted, but you can't hear anything. Can you please maybe change the microphone or something? Okay, I think uh, there is a technical problem on, on Professor's side. We'll drive back to you. Uh, let him put it in the chat. If he hears, uh, Professor Tudor, write in the chat. We'll, we'll be able to get it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prof. Uh, and thank you, Dr. Emmanuel, for taking us through the Q&A as well. And thank you, Prof, for the presentation and for answering all the questions. Um, I thought we might still have anything else, but we are at the top of the hour. Um, if they are, we really wanted to hear from Prof Wilson, but unfortunately we can't, uh, we can't seem to get up past the sound for his microphone. Um, maybe if you can just put your comment in the chat, we can at least not miss what you wanted to say. But otherwise, thank you all for being here. Thank you for your comments in the chat and your input. Thank you for the questions and all the engagement, as well as the Q&A. It, it has been a very engaging um, session. And thank you to those who have shared their personal experiences. Also, I think they've helped uh, in terms of learning uh, for, for, for others and also to know that there is help out there. So thank you, everyone. If there are no further uh, questions, no further contributions, let me say thank you to Prof. Sisi. Thank you for being with us once again. We appreciate your input. Thank you, Dr. Emmanuel. Thank you, Eugene, for the French interpretation. And thank you to all our participants for the active uh, inter um, interaction that you've given today. Have a lovely day. Good afternoon. Good day. Thank you. And uh, have a nice Thank day. you and bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye. Uh, I see Pendo is just keep uh, giving a comment that EMDR is available in Uganda. So sure. I think we are following the chat there. Okay. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Bye, everyone.